today, and that is today's topic being a continuation of something we began last week on corporations. You know that we spent a little time last week trying to become familiar with the requirements last week and saved these for this week on purpose. We want to talk a bit about corporations and kind of the rest of the story at this point. A few of the things we need to talk about today, just to clue you in, get you ready for this. What is retained earnings? Or with the English department right across the hall and my voice probably going into their offices right this minute, maybe they're thinking, what are retained earnings? Retained earnings sounds plural, doesn't it? Yes or no? Yes. It's one thing. It's singular. Even as awkward as it sounds, it's correct to say, what is retained earnings? We need to know. And that's what we're going to do today in class and all week long is try to figure it out. Definition-wise, experience-wise, comfort level-wise, so you'll have an understanding at a level that you could build on. This is a foundation. This is the rest of the story. We need to know what retained earnings is. How's it changed? How are we going to increase it? How are we going to decrease it? Cash dividends play a role in that. One of the big topics this week is about cash dividends. Not the hardest topic we've ever covered. It's something you can manage and accomplish. On the other hand, stock dividends might deserve some attention. It's probably the most complicated part of the chapter that we're choosing to cover. There are also several things in the chapter we're not doing. And you need to figure that out, too, by the selection of homework assignments and what's not assigned, by what we choose to go over in class and not hold you responsible for. You can figure out that there are several things this week that are covered in the chapter that we're not covering. I'd like to get to stock splits today. I rarely do. If I don't get to it today, I'm planning to do one of those little tag-on endings in my office to try to finish the notes. It's not a major topic. It's just one that you deserve to hear addressed if you'd like to. Uh, it is mentioned in a homework problem or two. This is kind of the list that we want to accomplish. Uh, again, a continuation of last week. Last week, we learned that stockholders' equity was the new name for capital, that there were two parts to stockholders' equity. Their names are paid in and retained. And in that, we looked at paid in last week. It was what owners invested in the business. The transaction between the owner and the business. When the business gets assets and responds by giving out shares of stock, that's owner invested in the business. That's paid in capital. The other section that we named last week was this retained earnings part, but we talked about it very little. We talked about it and moved on, saving that conversation for this week, the paid in capital section, the retained capital section. We're going to talk in detail about retained earnings this week. Uh, I don't seem to be working. So, I hope you're curious about what retained earnings is. It's an odd term. It's, as many other terms, words chosen on purpose to communicate an idea, a thought, cost of goods sold. Words carefully chosen to describe what that is so that you would know it. I thought we might start by just considering the terminology itself. and having you feel more comfortable with it by uh, 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 choosing another word. How about a synonym for each of these words that would be a, a description that you could understand better? Let's take them one at a time. May I have a volunteer to substitute for the word retained another word that you could relate to? What does retained mean? Some of you. Want to talk to me? Held. Held. Good. I heard somebody back there. I heard you say it. Kept. Kept. It doesn't have to be my <laughs> word. I was thinking kept. 
retained. We could think of lots of examples. Here's one. Some of you wore braces. And after you'd worn them a couple of years and you'd succeeded in getting your teeth aligned the way you and your parents and the orthodontist wanted them to, they took the braces off. My, your teeth looked great. How are we going to keep them looking that way? What would you wear after that? A retainer. Aha. So that we can keep your teeth in that position, you had to wear a retainer for a while, sleep in it, those kinds of things, right? Kept, retained. Let's turn to earnings. How about a synonym for earnings in a business? There are lots of things you could say right now. I just need one good one. Profits. I was thinking profits. Kept, profits. Retained, earnings. Kept, profits. Well, with that in mind, how do we get here? If retained earnings are kept profits, then maybe we've got some choices. Let's think about the choice of words and the impact that we're describing here. This is not in your note-taking guide, I don't think. I've been customarily sliding this over and writing this on the market board. Think with me back to first semester. First week, we <laughs> named four reasons that capital ever changed. Can you name them collectively as a group right this minute? They're still the same four if you name them in another order. I like them in a particular order. The first reason that capital would change in any business organization is, everybody said? Investments. Investments by the own. And the second reason capital changes is no. withdrawals by the own. The third reason? No. And the fourth? Expenses. Well, I was hoping you already knew that and didn't even have to write it down. And if you're having to write it down, why don't you just use first letters? If I'd written it on the marker board right this minute, that's all I would have written. Just as a reminder, that was foundation that you should have brought into the course already. Now, how does this idea that you're supposed to already know help us understand what retained earnings is for a corporation? Well. Or, or, or what even the owner's capital accounts are. The stockholder's equity section is. Last week, we talked about the owner investing in the business. When the owner invests in the business, that is the paid-in portion of owner's equity. And withdrawals by the owner are the equivalent of dividends for a corporation they have more similarities than they do differences. So we said withdrawal by the owner, historically, dividends are the name that corporation gives a distribution of earnings when everybody that owns stock gets something proportionately to what they own. If investments by the owner represent paid in, all the other things there withdrawals, dividends, that's the same one, revenue and expense come out to be the retained portion, the retained earnings portion of this four item list. So let's think about the components. Revenue and expense yield net income, earnings. We have two choices. We either distribute the earnings, dividends, or we don't. We hold them. We keep them. Earnings that we keep, retained earnings, are you with me or not? Mm -hmm. Belong to whom? Earnings that we keep belong to whom? Corporation. Corporation. Whose earnings are they? If you give them out, who gets them? The owners, the stockholders. Why do I only have five people answering that question? More of you know that than are willing to say it. Come on, talk to me. If we pay out dividends, who gets them? Stockholders. Stockholders. And if we choose not to pay them out, yet keep them in the company, they become retained earnings. To whom do they belong? Corporation. They still belong to the owner. They're still the owners no matter what. We were profitable. 
who benefits from the corporation being profitable but the owner? That's the mission of the corporation is to return wealth to the owner. And you either give it to them or you keep it in the business, but if you keep it in the business, that increases the owner's equity, the stockholder's equity. The owner's claims on assets, it still belongs to the owner. What kind of an account is retained earnings? Say it. Asset, liability, capital, revenue, expense. Say something. Capital. It's capital. What's the new name for capital? Say it. How many parts are there? What are their names? Come on, more people know this than are saying it to me right this minute. Paid in and retained. Paid in and retained. And we're talking about retained. It's capital. What's its normal balance? Debit or credit? Credit. The balance of capital is credit. The balance of common stock is credit. The balance of retained earnings is credit. It's increased with a credit. It's decreased with a debit. The primary reason to increase it is because you've been profitable. Net income increases owner's equity. And for a corporation, that's called retained earnings. If you have net loss, that decreases owner's equity. Duh. You've got a choice of distributing those earnings, we call that <coughs> dividends. Distributing the earnings will decrease retained earnings. Or not. If you don't distribute those earnings, then they're still in the retained earnings account, thus the name, retained earnings. An equity account that represents an additional owner's claim on assets. Are you with me? Yes or no? Yes. yes. It's capital. It's owner's equity. Let's talk about eh, net income one more time. Let's not be afraid to state the obvious. How do you get net income, somebody? I didn't quite hear you speak. Higher revenue than expenses. True, but I meant literally when you prepare an income statement, how do you determine net income, John? Revenue minus expenses. It's a silly little thing, but I'm trying to get through to you verbally and visually. Look at the screen a second. What makes up retained earnings but revenue and expense? Did you see the point I just made? Retained earnings is revenue and expense. The net result, the combination, originated with the excess of revenue over expense. Retained earnings is increased by net income. and decreased by dividends. With that background, we're trying to get closer to the topic of the week, that being the impact of cash and stock dividends on retained earnings. Let's talk about cash dividends. I've already said that it's the equivalent of withdrawals by the owner for a proprietorship or a partnership. For the most part, that's true. One of the things I'd like to talk about right off is that the decision to have this withdrawal by the owner rest in a different place. So the first semester and early this semester we were a proprietorship and a partnership. If a one owner business needs to have some money to buy groceries or to make the house payment or to send the child to summer camp or to buy clothes for the children, personal activities, then at their will, the owner's decision, you go to the business, you take some of those business funds, you put them in your personal bank account, and you spend them for personal reasons. That's what we know and understand a withdrawal by the owner to be. True or false? True. Whose decision was it? It was the owner's. Is that the way it works for a corporation? Pretend I own a lot of Walmart stock. Can I just call over to Bentonville and say, um, I'm expecting a big expense by Friday. Would you mind mailing me my dividend check this week? Is that the way it works? No. No. The point I'm trying to make is that the decision now rests with the corporation. And that's one of the things we need to talk about in this section. I believe there are three requirements 
that must be met before a dividend can be distributed to owners. And one of those is there must be enough cash to do it. When the decision maker, the board of trustees perhaps, makes this decision, they're going to decide, do we have enough money to do this? It would be stupid to declare a cash dividend and then have to borrow money to meet the payroll on Friday. It'd be stupid to declare a cash dividend and not be able to pay our bills and ruin our credit rating. Am I getting through to you? Yeah. It'd be stupid to declare a cash dividend and not have enough money to pay our bills and take advantage of the cash discount. Do you remember 210 net 30 from first semester? Yes? Where it was considered to be a good sound business practice to pay our bills within the 10 days, take advantage of the discount. If we declare a cash dividend and can't take that cash dividend, that uh, cash discount, that wouldn't be smart. There's got to be enough money to run the business effectively and pay out a cash dividend on top of that. There must be sufficient cash. There must be sufficient retained earnings. And some of you think I'm talking mumbo jumbo, that I just said the same thing twice, that this was redundant. And it's not. There are two requirements. They're distinctly different, sufficient cash and sufficient retained earnings. First of all, we must have been profitable in the past. We must not have already distributed earnings where there are none left to distribute if we're going to declare a cash dividend. Let's talk about this misconception that cash and retained earnings are the same thing. Too many uninformed individuals, and I'm trying for you not to fall in that group, too many uninformed individuals think that net income and cash are the same thing. Even some of you probably do. Please, don't successfully complete two courses and make a good grade and think that net income and cash are the same thing. It was a greater emphasis in the first semester. If you still don't understand it, have a conversation with somebody, one of your teachers, or somebody to help you understand that. Don't finish this course thinking that's true. They just aren't, and you need to know the difference. Retained earnings and cash are not the same thing. That's the reason I brought it up today. Many students think so. Only cash is cash. You know, we've got a monetary amount in rent expense or equipment or <laughs> supplies or prepaid insurance or accounts payable. All of those are in monetary terms, but literally cash is only in one account, and that is the account called cash. Now here's what's going to happen. If you're not astute enough to pick this up today and be informed today, you run a great risk of showing up on the job someday in the long run or showing up in an upper division class in the short run where you and your teammates have to analyze the case and present it in class as if your classmates are the board of directors and your teacher is sitting in on that being part of the board of directors and maybe your proposal for this case situation that you're analyzing is Oh, we're going to expand the plan and we're going to buy all this new equipment. And then the question comes up, how are you going to pay for it? And you say, oh, no problem. We'll just pay for it out of retained earnings. Is that going to work? Come on. Talk to me. Is that a good answer or a wrong answer? That's a wrong answer. You look bad in front of your classmates. You look bad in front of your teacher. And you make me look bad. Where'd you take accounting? You think retained earnings is cash? You can't pay anything out of retained earnings. Retained earnings is a monetary amount that represents profit that you've accumulated in the past and haven't yet paid it out to the owners, but it's capital. It's a claim on assets, and it's not a pool of cash waiting for you to spend on new equipment. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Yes. Please don't fall into that trap. Retained earnings is not cash. 
We ought to talk about what it takes to declare a cash dividend. It takes sufficient cash. It takes sufficient unrestricted retained earnings. And it takes action by the board of directors. That's the distinction I tried to draw in my earlier example. A proprietor decides and makes the withdrawal and spends the money for personal purposes. A corporation, the corporation decides and they distribute the dividend to all the owners proportionally. You own a lot, you get a lot. If you own a little, you get a little. But everybody gets something, everybody who owns something. The decision rests with the corporation. So let's pretend that we all own shares of stock of the same company. And today's the day we got together to take the vote. And somebody shows up with the amount of cash that we have and we've discussed it a bit and now we're ready to vote. And one of you says, I move that we declare a dollar per share dividend. And somebody else in the room says, I second it. And then the chair of the board says, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? <laughs> the eyes have it. It takes action by the board of directors. Do you understand my point? Yes or no? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. So, there's a secretary to the board of directors. And the secretary keeps minutes. And in the minutes, we're going to say the date and the amount and that the motion passed. And on that date, for the first time, we became legally obligated to pay that dividend. There is no legal obligation to pay a dividend until the board of directors takes action. And once they've taken action, they will specify three important dates associated with that action. First of all, it's the date they took the action. That date has a name. It's called the date of declaration. When they took the vote and it passed, that's the date of declaration. And in the motion, they would also name two other dates. The date of record is a significant date for us. The date of record is the date we want to establish ownership. We need to know to whom the check should be mailed. We need to know to whom the check should be made payable. Don't you want to know who owns your business? Sure you do. Don't you want to know who has the right to vote? Sure you do. And share in earnings and the preemptive right and the right to share in assets and liquidation? Sure you do. And you maintain that ownership all year long. I, I equate it to the relationship that we learned first semester about accounts receivable. Don't you want to know how much your customers owe you? Say yes or no. Yes. So we established, learned about an accounts receivable control account where we have summary information and an accounts receivable subsidiary ledger where we have all the details and we posted to the subsidiary and we posted to the control and we made sure that they agreed with one another. Remember? Yes or no? Yes. We should do the same thing with common stock or preferred stock. Common stock should be a control account that is supported by a subsidiary ledger called the stockholders ledger that has all the details about who owns your stock and how many shares they own. And if we're a publicly held company, stocks are being bought and sold every day. On the date of record, we're attempting to draw a line in the sand. If you buy the stock before that day, we want to know it because you're going to get the dividend. If you've owned the stock for a long time and you sell the stock right here and don't own it anymore, you won't get the dividend. The new owner will because whoever's holding that stock on this day, the date of record, gets the dividend. We need to establish ownership. We need to know who that is. And right after that, we go on with life. Buying and selling and buying and selling and updating the records and at some point, Again, we'll draw another line and pay another dividend. On the third date, the date of payment, we actually put the checks in the mail. On the date of declaration, we become obligated to do it. On the date of record, we establish to whom the checks will be mailed. And on the date of payment, we put the checks in the mail for those individuals. 
the people that own the stock on the date of record. Here's a, a clipping I clipped out of the Tulsa World several years ago. I hope you know that Williams Company is um, headquartered here in town. They're a great corporate citizen. We're very grateful for what they do in the community. Williams Company Inc. on Friday declared a fourth quarter dividend on the company's common stock of 35 cents a share. The board also declared a fourth quarter dividend of 96.8 cents per share on the company's 3.875 convertible exchangeable preferred stock, just preferred adjectives. The common stock dividend is payable December the 24th to stockholders of record at the close of business on November 30th. So they took action, they specified the date, the secretary took minutes, and now they've given a press release so that the media can cover this, the newspaper picked it up, and the newspaper's telling everybody else what happened in the board meeting. Are you with me or not? Thank you for that overwhelming response. The preferred <laughs> stock dividend is payable on December 31st to stockholders of record at the close of business on December the 14th. We're not talking about obscure items. We're talking about real life stuff that happens. The date it happened, the date of record, the date of payment are all parts, important parts, of this dividend that we're accounting for. These dates have accounting significance to us. We need to know what activity we should do when those things happen. When we have an owner withdraw from a proprietorship or a partnership, we debit John Doe drawing and credit cash, ultimately. You should have known that when you enrolled in this course. How is that entry the same or different than a withdrawal by the corporation? A dividend. On the date of declaration, on the day the board of directors takes action, we become legally obligated to do this for the first time. We're going to debit an account called cash dividends and credit an account called dividends payable. We ought to talk about it. Let's talk about the credit. What is dividends payable? Asset, liability, capital, revenue, expense, what do you think? Say something. Liability. It's normal balance, it's debit or credit. credit? It's a current liability. It's a liability that's going to be paid in a short period of time. Dividends payable. Which reminds me of the concept I've been describing all along. Two or three or four times I've said, now we're legally obligated to do this. We're admitting that legal obligation by crediting dividends payable. And we're going to debit an account called cash dividends. Never have we encountered so many account names, new account names, in such a short period of time except when you were introduced to all of them. Cash dividends is an account that reminds me of John Doe drawing. John Doe drawing is contra capital. Cash dividends is contra capital. For John Doe drawing, that's all we can say. For cash dividends, we've got some subparts. Is this contra paid in or contra retained? It's contra retained. That's what we're talking about this week. Dividends reduces retained earnings. Cash dividends is a contra retained earnings account. It will be closed in the closing process. If you think about the four steps that you knew from first semester, you closed Revenue, expense, income summary, and drawing. <clears throat> in the fourth step of closing entries, in just a moment, we'll talk about closing dividends. Two retained earnings. It's contra retained earnings. Now on the date of record, we want to establish ownership. We've got transactions occurring in the marketplace. We want to post all of those to the database. All of those to the subsidiary ledger. And we're going to stop at that point. It doesn't take a journal entry to do that. It does take accounting effort. It does take an activity to get up, get caught up with all those transactions. If you're asked in some other forum what happens on the date of record, don't say nothing. If nothing happens on the date of record, we don't need the date of record. A lot happens on the date of record. But it doesn't take a journal entry to accomplish that. It takes posting to the subsidiary ledger. On the date of payment, we're going to debit the liability account we created in the first step and fulfill that liability by actually mailing the checks. Debit dividends payable. Credit cash <coughs> for the amount of the dividend 
that's being put in the mail. You're eliminating the liability of the corporation on that day. Three significant dates, three significant accounting consequences based on that. We need to know the distinction between them. Now, punctuation-wise, I need you to see that this is not the fourth step in the same series. It would be misleading. I wanted to say it more than once. I said it a minute ago, hoping that you'd catch it. But in case you didn't catch it, I wanted to give you an opportunity to get it. There are four steps in closing entries. In the first step, you close revenue to income summary. In the second step, expenses to income summary. In the third step, income summary to capital. That's John Doe capital for a proprietorship. That's John Doe capital and Mary Smith capital for a partnership. That's debit income summary and credit Retained, earning. retained earnings for a corporation. And that's in homework this week. Was last and is this. Did you hear me? The third step in closing entries this week. One more time. Debit income summary and credit retained, retained earnings. earnings. And then the fourth step. We've debited cash dividends here. In the fourth step of closing entries, we're going to close cash dividends by crediting it and reduce retained earnings. It's a temporary retained earnings account. It's contra retained earnings. Now it's been closed to retained earnings. Returned, retained earnings will be less because of this cash dividend that you declared and paid. If you're with me right this minute, say yes. 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 If you've got a question, write it in the margin and think about it and try to get an answer for it soon. In the fifth through eighth edition of this book, we would spend some time right this minute talking about the way the book presented it. I don't know if you noticed or not, but in the heading, I labeled what you just heard the real life method. I'm here to and very pleased to announce that the textbook has seen the light and they've come over to our side and they're now illustrating in the chapter and requiring in homework that you follow the real life method. There is no distinction between the way in which it's covered in the chapter and the way we'd like for you to do it in homework so we don't have to talk about a comparison anymore, nor require you to do it real life method instead of the way you see it in the book. And I didn't discover that in time to change the handout to reflect that. Okay. Let's talk about stock dividends and contrast them with cash dividends. Cash dividends and stock dividends are distinctly different. One of the first questions students ask me, especially when you're trying to do a homework problem, is, are they telling me about a cash dividend or are they telling me about a stock dividend? Well, I, I don't want to talk down to you or belittle you in any way right this minute. It may sound that way and I don't mean it to be, honestly. It's as simple and straightforward as when they pay a cash dividend, when they pay cash, excuse me, when they pay cash, that's a cash dividend. When they give stock, that's a stock dividend. That's how you tell the difference. You have to read carefully. You have to know the circumstances. If it says, like the newspaper article, that they declared a 35 cent per share dividend, what kind of a dividend is that? Say something. That's a cash dividend. But if they declare a 5% stock dividend, that's a stock dividend. Read carefully. You should be able to tell that based on the words that they chose to describe it to you. Stock dividends are a little bit the same, but more distinctly different than cash dividends. It may take you all week to understand them well. Let's do our best today. Stock dividends have a whole lot of words we could use to describe them. Right this minute, this may be a little wah 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 for you. Read it again at the end of the week, okay? First of all, a cash dividend distributes assets to the shareholders. A stock dividend does not. No assets of the company are actually being distributed to the shareholders. And it's simply a shift from the retained section to the paid-in section. I hope I say that several times today. It makes retained get smaller and paid-in get larger by the amount of the cash dividend by the, by the market value of the stock dividend the day the board of directors took action. And finally, 
the shareholder might be tempted to go out and sell these new shares. If they do so, they won't own as much of the business as they did before. If they go out and sell those shares, they actually own less of the business now. They could have just gone out and sold some of their existing shares. I think you got the message. I'll say it one more time. If you own 10% of a business before the dividend, you'll have to keep those new shares to own 10% of the <coughs> stock after the dividend is declared and distributed. It represents the same thing you already own. A stock dividend is distinctly different from a cash dividend. Here's the same slide you saw earlier. Three important dates associated with a cash dividend. Let's edit it and have it become a stock dividend. We're still going to take action. The day we do is called the date of declaration. We still need to own, know who owns the stock. We still need to establish ownership. That's the date of record. We're going to post and catch up. But it would be misleading to call it a date of payment. We're not going to pay this dividend. We're going to distribute new shares of stock. I'm just looking for a better choice of words. Let's call it the date of distribution. The date the shares of stock are actually put in the mail. We need to know the dates and we need to know what significance those dates have to us in accounting terms. On the date of declaration, we need to make a journal entry similar to the one on the screen. It debits stock dividends for the market value of the stock the day the board of directors declared the dividend. Stock dividends reminds me of two accounts we've discussed already. John Doe drawing, contra capital, and cash dividends, contra capital. Stock dividends is contra capital, contra retained earnings. It reduces retained earnings. Perhaps the most unusual account title ever, stock dividends distributable is credited with par. If I could get you to see the significance of the amount here, par, and think back to last chapter where we always kept up with stock at par if it had par, this ought to reveal to you that mm, I got a feeling that's just shares of stock waiting to be issued. That's exactly what it is. You ought to write in your margin that stock dividends distributable is a temporary paid-in stock <coughs> equity account. These are shares of stock waiting to be issued. It's a temporary paid-in stockholders' equity account. Watch when it turns to permanent equity in just a moment. Then paid-in capital in excess of par is the balancing account because market and par were different. So let's talk about why it's called stock dividends distributable and not stock dividends payable. If it had the word payable in its name, you would think it was a liability. If you thought it was a liability, and if it were a liability, then the best way to eliminate our obligation would to be paid with cash. And that's not true. This obligation we have is not fulfilled with the payment of cash. This obligation we created the day the board of directors voted is only fulfilled with issuing stock. We have an obligation to issue stock. It's not payable. It's distributable. A temporary paid-in stockholders equity account. And obviously those could be stated value if it had stated value rather than pop about words that you saw before and another way to try to get through to you. On another page, you wrote down that a stock dividend increased paid in and decreased retained. A shift from retained to paid in. Well, if you think about the nature of these accounts and what happens when you post this entry, that's exactly what take, takes place. Stock dividends is contra retained earnings. You're reducing retained earnings. Stock dividends distributable is temporary paid in. It's got a credit balance. You're crediting it. It's causing to go up. And paid in capital in excess of par is paid in. It's going up. It went, paid in accounts went up equal to the market price of the stock on the day it was declared. And retained earnings went down by that same amount. The journal entries would be to make the entry to declare it, to establish ownership on the date of record, 
to post to the subsidiary ledger all those transactions that we needed to up until that point so we'd establish ownership. And then finally, to distribute these shares of stock. We want to see that stock dividends distributable account, that temporary account, become a permanent one. And that's the other thing about this being at par and your understanding of what par's significance was last week. It is that account that is now becoming permanent equity. If you debit that same account, you zeroed it out. And you credited common stock. Now these shares are in the hands of the shareholders. They have all the rights. Before this, they were just shares waiting to be issued. They couldn't vote. They couldn't share in earnings and so forth. Now that we've issued the shares, they have all those rights. You need to connect those two in your mind. When I look at your work and see that you made this entry for a different number than you made the previous one, it seems to me that you didn't connect some wire that you should have. I need you to see the connection between these two entries. You made all the tough decisions in the first one. Get the first one right, this one should be easier when you actually issue the stock we issue it at par. In the fourth step of closing entries, it is not the same sequence as these. The punctuation is different. There are three journal entries, three mentions of journal entries. This is not the same list. This is a list of closed revenue in the first step, closed expense in the second step, closed income summary to retained earnings in the third step, closed cash and stock dividends in the fourth step. I'll just tell you that the teacher's manual makes two entries for this step, and I don't see any point in that. I don't see why you couldn't make a compound journal. How about credit stock dividends, credit cash dividends, sum these two, and debit retained earnings one time for the sum of both. If you do it in your homework that way, let's hope the graders don't mark it up. It would be a good way to do it. Zero out stock dividends, zero out cash dividends, reduce retained earnings by those previous amounts that you recorded in the fourth step of closing entries. I already did that. I want to talk to you real quickly about this picture. I can do it fast and you can listen fast. It's going to take several opportunities to get you to fully understand what stock dividends are. I've already encouraged you to reread the words you wrote down today, later in the week, to try to make sense of it. Hear this story quickly and let that help you understand what stock dividends and cash dividends do. Two identical corporations. They both have the same amount of assets. They both have the same composition of equity, liabilities and owner's equity. The corporation on the left declares and pays a cash dividend, actually takes some of the assets of the business and places it, the money in the hands of the shareholders. The shareholders really <coughs> get cash. The corporation on the right declares and distributes a stock dividend. Today you've heard that pay in gets larger and retained gets smaller. It's a shift from retained to paid in. The total assets of the company are, exact, are exactly the same. The shareholder winds up holding shares of stock that represent the same claim on assets that they already had. We need to talk about it this week. We picked out some homework problems and some exercises to do in class to try to get the message across. This is the hardest thing this week. You'll want to give it sufficient quality time. Hey, thanks for allowing me a moment to talk with you about the remaining topic about stock splits. Stock splits are distinctly different from cash dividends and stock dividends about which we've already talked. And students are often curious, hear about stock splits in the real world, and they'd like to know about them from an accounting perspective. So I'm thankful for that opportunity to try to explain it to you in really, really basic, simple terms. Um, some corporations have historically uh, had stock that sold for a large amount. The per share amount was large. Maybe the share sold for 300 or 400 or 500 dollars per share. 
And that really gives us two opportunities to make a decision about how we feel about that. One would be, who cares? It doesn't matter. The only time the corporation is changed is when the individual invests in the corporation and the corporation responds by issuing a share of stock. And if that's not taking place, then it really shouldn't matter. And the other side of the story is perhaps uh, the public at large views the company differently because they have high price stock. Maybe that's a favorable thing. They think of it better because it sells for a lot or maybe it's not such a favorable thing and investors sometimes would like to buy lots of shares of lower price stock and therefore a stock selling at a high price discourages what we call the freedom of entry into and the freedom of exit from the marketplace. It's hard for a, a, an investor without very much money to buy a high price stock. And because of that, it's hard for an investor owning high price stock to be able to sell that to another investor who might not have a lot to invest. So there's these two alternatives. Um, who really cares? And uh, maybe we do care and maybe we'd like to do something about it. Uh, a stock split is literally a reduction in the par value. So if we had $100 par that we changed to $50 par, we would call that a two for one split. If you'll give me your one share that you own at $100 par, I'll replace it with two shares of stock, each of which have $50 par. You'll be in exactly the same place as you were before, except you'll have twice as many shares. And it could be some other proportion. But remember, it's a reduction in the par value of the stock. It doesn't require a journal entry. Cash dividends and stock dividends cause us to make journal entries. Stock splits don't, except we do need some historical record in the company to do that. When general journals were uh, written out by hand, it became almost like a diary. We wrote what we called a memo or a memorandum entry just to describe that historical fact chronologically, where it occurred. And I'm not sure we have the ability to do that electronically. We just need some historical evidence that it took place. And at the same time, we might want to redetermine the number of shares that are authorized, the number of shares that are issued, the number of shares that are outstanding, and what par value they have in total. It does not change, a stock split does not change the total amount of paid in capital, nor the amount of retained earnings. The total assets of the company are the same. The total stockholders' equity is the same. None of the account titles would be different. The one big impact would be that this stock that used to sell for a whole lot now sells for a, a much smaller amount after the split. And that's the whole idea. What we'd like to do is drive down the price in the marketplace for which the share of stock sells. If we drive it down, then more people can trade stock. More people can buy and sell stock. They can do it more easily. A stock split will effectively reduce the price of the stock at which it sells in the marketplace. So I know I gave one simple example. Let's do one other. Let's say we had $100 par stock that we changed to $20 par. If we reduce the stock that much, we, that would be a five for one split we would accept your one share of stock and give you five shares in exchange. Now, that would be a tremendous reduction in the selling price of the stock. The stock would go down, the price of the stock would go down by five, five times. It would sell for five times less than it did before. So there's a simple version of stock splits. You know that we've covered cash dividends and stock dividends, the definition of retained earnings, and I hope you have a better understanding of all those things. Have a great day.